Welcome to church today. My name is Adam. I'm the lead pastor at Oasis Church, and it is really great to have you with us today. We've uh, gathered together to worship God, to open His Word, to encourage one another. This is why we come together every week, week in, week out, and this is what we're going to do today. But today will also be slightly different to normal. Hopefully you received the email this week, which was letting you know that today in our service, we'll be touching on a difficult topic. We'll be sharing an apology from the CRCA, which is the denomination we belong to on the matter of child sexual abuse. And we'll be discussing important issues related to this important matter. Now, obviously this is a difficult and it's a sensitive topic. And so we wanted to give you the opportunity to excuse yourself from the service if you need to. We also wanted to give you the opportunity to send your kids out of the service if that's what you'd like to do. And so in a moment when we stand to sing, please feel free to excuse yourself at that point and please feel free to send your kids out to Nathaniel. Nathaniel's our youth pastor. He's waiting at the front doors and, and he will take our kids out for a, a program at the start of the service before bringing them back before the, the Bible reading and the sermon. Now, if you're a, a guest with us or if this is your first time with us today, obviously this is not what we normally do and what we normally t talk about. But this is an important matter for us to talk about and for us to bring before God in prayer. So in just a moment, we're gonna stand, we're gonna sing, and, and please feel free to do that. If you'd like to send your kids out, you can do so with Nathaniel up the back. But as we prepare our hearts to sing, can I invite you to stand? And I'm gonna read for us from Psalm 68, which says, sing to God, Sing in praise of His name. Extol Him who rides on the clouds. Rejoice before Him. His name is the Lord. A father to the fatherless, a defender of widows is God in His holy dwelling. Praise be to the Lord, to God our Saviour, who daily bears our burdens. Our God is a God who saves. And stand before your Maker, full of wonder, full of fear. Come behold His power and glory, yet with confidence draw near. For the One who holds the heavens and commands the stars above is the God who bends to bless us with an unrelenting love. Sacrificial blood, bringing reconciliation to a world that longs to know the affections of the Father who will never let them go. of your King and with trembling rejoice. All our sickness, all our sorrows, Jesus carried up the hill. He has walked His path before us. He is walking with us still. Turning tragedy to triumph, turning agony to praise. There is blessing in the battle, so take heart and stand amazed. 
these words from Ephesians 1. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that He lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. 
I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Let's stand together and let's sing, let's declare that our hope is found in Christ alone. that you are our God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, our only Saviour, the Prince of Peace. Lord, may we hold fast to who you are, what you have promised. You are our hope. May we know the hope you have called us to, the riches of your glorious inheritance. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name. And we all said, Amen. Amen. Let's take our seats. That is a precious truth. In Christ alone, my hope is found. If you missed it at the start, my name's Adam. I'm part of the team here and it's uh, really great to be with you today. Just have a few quick announcements that I'd like to share with you. 
Yesterday, uh, we had our marriage conference down here at the church. Almost 100 people gathered together to, to hear from God's Word and to be encouraged and enriched uh, in our journey of marriage. And I personally found it so um, helpful, uh, convicting, encouraging, all those kinds of things wrapped up in one. If you weren't here, uh, I would just encourage you next year when the marriage conference is on, make sure you put it in your diaries and come along. If you have uh, little ones with you in the service, we have a parents' room that's available. If you head back into the foyer and turn to your left, you'll see a door there. Uh, if you need to feed or change or do any of those kinds of things, please just feel free to use that. If uh, you are a guest or a visitor with us this morning and you'd like to, to find out a little bit more perhaps about faith or perhaps about us as a church, then uh, you can head to the Connection Centre after the service to chat with some of the team. If you're online, you can just click Get Connected, fill out that form and we'll follow you up. Or after the service, we're holding what we call Connect Coffee. Now, this is the perfect space if you're new or newish to just find out a little bit more about who we are as a church, to meet some of the team and to ask any questions that you might have. It's held in the park, which is our cafe area just out there. We'll shout you a coffee and we'll do our very best to get you plugged in and connected. You know, Connect Coffee is actually the first step in a process that we ultimately hope leads to, to faith in Jesus and belonging to His church as a member. And we recently had a whole bunch of people uh, join us as members. You can see their smiling, lovely faces on the screen. They uh, came along to a membership course, and after that, they said, we want to join God in what He's doing here. We, we want to join in the mission to help more people find life in Jesus. And so if you see them around, make sure you say hi part of the family now. And uh, if you'd like to explore becoming a member, our next membership course is actually happening next Sunday after the 10 a.m. service. We put on lunch, share a little bit about who we are as a church and how you might get involved. So next Sunday, you can register online on our website uh, for that. We'd love to see you there. Also, if you haven't yet had the opportunity to, to give, there's all the usual ways to do that online, through our website, uh, the exits, through the giving boxes, or the Connection Center through the FPOS machine. But thank you for your partnership in the gospel as we seek to see more people find life that is truly life in Jesus Christ. I'm going to lead us in prayer now before we open up God's Word together. And I know perhaps we have all different kinds of things rattling around in our hearts and in our minds. And the good news is that whatever we might be feeling, we can bring it all to our God in prayer. We can bear our hearts to Him and we can bring our requests to Him. And so why don't we take a moment to do that right now? Would you join me as we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you that though you are high and lifted up and you dwell in unapproachable light, you also care for the poor and the needy and the hurting and the broken. For those who are willing to humble themselves before you and to seek your help. And Lord, we are those needy people and so we come humbly to you in the name of Jesus. We lift up our whole selves to you, Lord. We lift up our bodies to you. Some of us struggle with, with chronic pain and sickness or disability. Some of us are feeling the effects of aging. Some of us are, are recovering from surgery or other treatments. Whatever it might be, in all these weaknesses, Lord, have mercy on us. And by your Spirit, bring us help and healing and hope. Lord, we lift up our souls to you. Each one of us every day face daily battles against stubborn weaknesses and besetting sins. And they can be deeply discouraging. And so Lord, help us for your name's sake to, to hate and to put to death all of the many ways in which we sin against you. The ways in which we mistrust you the ways in which we love ourselves more than others and more than you, the way in which we crave comfort or success or approval from others more than your approval. Lord, forgive us. Lord, we lift up our church to you. 
Equip us to love and serve one another with the power, the gifts, and the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Move us to love and serve and give with the same generosity you have shown us in giving us the Lord Jesus. Give us great unity in the gospel by the power of your spirit and give us a great desire to feed on your word. And as we open your word right now, Lord, we ask and pray that you'd also open our eyes, open our ears and open our hearts so that we might see and hear and cherish your glory and your goodness and your truth in the face of the Lord Jesus. And we pray this gratefully in his name. And all God's people said, Amen. We are going to read God's word together now. If you have your Bibles with you, you can open them to 1 Kings chapter 2. 1 Kings is in the Old Testament about a quarter of the way through. We kicked off our series last week and today we'll be looking at 1 Kings chapter 2 and we'll be reading verses 1 to 12. You can follow along in your Bibles or on the screen as well. When the time drew near for David to die, he gave a charge to Solomon, his son. I'm about to go the way of all the earth, he said. So be strong, act like a man, and observe what the Lord your God requires. Walk in obedience to him and keep his decrees and commands, his laws and regulations as written in the law of Moses. Do this so that you may prosper in all you do and wherever you go, and that the Lord may keep his promise to me. If your descendants watch how they live, and if they walk faithfully before me with all their heart and soul, you will never fail to have a successor on the throne of Israel. Now you yourself know what Joab, son of Zariah, did to me, what he did to the two commanders of Israel's armies, Abner, son of Ner, and Amasa, son of Jetha. He killed them, shedding their blood in peacetime as if in battle. And with that blood, he stained the belt round his waist and the sandals on his feet. Deal with him according to your wisdom, but do not let his gray head go down to the grave in peace. But show kindness to the sons of Barzillai of Gilead and let them be among those who eat at your table. They stood by me when I fled from your brother Absalom. And remember... You have with you Shimei, son of Gera, the Benjaminite from Bahurim, who called down bitter curses on me the day I went to Mahanim. When he came down to meet me at the Jordan, I swore to him by the Lord, I will not put you to death by the sword. But now do not consider him innocent. You are a man of wisdom. You will know what to do to him. Bring his gray head down to the grave in blood." Then David rested with his ancestors and was buried in the city of David. He had reigned for 40 years over Israel, seven years in Hebron and 33 in Jerusalem. So Solomon sat on the throne of his father David and his rule was firmly established. The word of God. Well, I was reading a blog by a pastor and a bit of a leadership guru this week, which had the title, Five Unsettling Cultural Predictions for the 2020s. And its first point was this, the current instability will continue. As much as you long for a return to normal, that's unlikely to happen. The disruption of a global pandemic was the final nail in normal's coffin. And he went on to make his argument for that. And whether he's right or wrong, he's certainly right about the last few years, isn't he? It's been an unstable few years. And you know, a lot of the instability and angst has been around the role of government. I mean, think about it. With the COVID pandemic, uh, the Australian government had to respond to that. Different states had lockdowns. We had a lockdown here. Vaccines were rolled out. Different safety precautions were rolled out. And Australians reacted to that differently. Some people said, this is good, this is just, this is loving. Some people said, this is deeply not good and deeply unjust and not loving, and this is hurting other people. And there's a whole lot of other people in between that. There's a lot of instability around the COVID-19 pandemic and the role of government. And when you think about the federal election last year, even the Labor Party who won it 
only won with 33% of the primary vote. Actually, a little bit less than that. Less than one third of Australians gave them their primary vote. And so it just shows you where the confidence of Australians is. It's not so much with the major parties anymore. In fact, the Teal independents rose up this, this last election. A lot of them received votes. It seems like Australians are less confident in the government, and there's been a bit of instability around the role of government, or what, what should good government do? When we think about the global scene, it's far more unstable. We think about the actions of Russia against Ukraine, and the actions of China against Taiwan, or what they want to do. There's actually a real threat of nuclear war in our world because of the bad decisions of government. Now, why do I say this? Well, don't we long for, when we think about this, don't we long for a government and leadership that can bring peace and security to our world, that can bring unity to people? What kind of government could achieve that? Or more specifically, what kind of leader would need to head up a government that could do that? Does it need to be a gentle leader or a loving leader? Or does it need to be like a strong man or a strong woman? Who could lead the world out of instability into peace and security? Well, believe it or not, our chapter today actually speaks into this issue. We're going to be looking at 1 Kings chapter 2. And if you haven't got your Bibles open, I encourage you to open them up or power them up uh, now. But first, before we get into that, let me introduce myself. I'm Ben. I'm the community pastor here. And we're in the middle of a series right now called The Rise and Fall of King Solomon. We're looking at the first 11 chapters of 1 Kings. Last week, we started the series in chapter 1. We looked at King David, who was old and cold and out of action. And there was a power vacuum developing. And, and even though Solomon had been promised by God that he would be the next king, one of David's sons, Adonijah, thought instead, I'll, I'll claim the kingship for myself. And he got a following and he had a feast and there was this massive crisis. But by the end of the chapter, the crisis was averted and Solomon was coronated as king. And so in chapter two, there is a new king on the block. His name is King Solomon. And we're going to be introduced to this new leader. Will he be the kind of leader the kingdom needs? Will he be able to bring stability and blessing to the nation, especially after the recent coup attempt? Or will it all fall to pieces as quickly as it just started? Let's jump into the passage together. We'll be looking at it under two headings, the criteria for God's king and the actions of God's king. The criteria for God's king in verses 1 to 12 and the actions of God's king in verses 13 to 46. First, the criteria. In verses 1 to 12, David gives Solomon instructions for how to reign as God's king. He gives him criteria for effective godly leadership. And David tells him to do three, three things, which I think is captured really nicely in the famous verse, Micah 6 verse 8 where it says to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. We can actually capture David's instructions under this verse, under those three things. And first, we're just going to look at to walk humbly with God. How did David tell Solomon to do that? Well, that comes in verses 1 to 4 of our passage. Adam read verses 2 to 3 for us earlier, where David told Solomon to be faithful to God by obeying his commands and keeping his laws and being faithful to the law of Moses. And those verses are actually some key verses for the books of First and Second Kings because they give us the criteria to evaluate how the kings are going in those books. Are they being faithful to God? Are they obeying the law of Moses, which is the first five books in our Old Testament? God's ideal king will walk humbly with him by obeying his word. And then as we move into verse 4, in your Bible, we see that David is talking about this because he has God's promise to him in mind. Adam mentioned this promise from 2 Samuel chapter 7 last week, but this is one of the most important promises in the Bible. I'm just going to read a little bit of it for you now. It says in verse 12 of 2 Samuel 7, this is what God said to David, when your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. 
This is the promise David has in mind. And he's looking at his own flesh and blood, Solomon, and he's hoping that he will be the fulfillment. And in fact, he is a partial fulfillment of this. What I want us to notice, though, in 2 Samuel 7, the promise, is the word establish. Notice how many times it's repeated with me for a moment. It, I just read it in verse 12, but it's also in verse 13. God said, I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And then verse 16, your throne will be established forever. Now, the reason I'm pointing that out is because when we see that, we actually see this promise, 2 Samuel 7, poking its head at us everywhere in 1 Kings chapter 2, our chapter today. Actually, that's what our chapter is all about. You'll notice the word established is repeated in our chapter in verse 12, in verse 24, in verse 45. It's different in English, but it's the same Hebrew word. And then in verse 46, the chapter ends with the kingdom was now established in Solomon's hands. Our chapter is all about the establishment of David's throne through the new king in the block, Solomon. This is why 1 Kings 2 shows us the kind of king or leader who can bring peace and security to society. And the first condition in the criteria for God's king, David says, is that he walk humbly with God by keeping his law. David also instructs Solomon to love mercy in verse 7. He tells Solomon to show kindness to the sons of Barzillai. Now, this wasn't the first coup attempt in Israel, which we saw last week. There was another coup attempted by one of David's other sons, Absalom. And during that attempt, David was on the run, and Barzillai, this wealthy man, came to David's aid, and he helped him and his men. He was kind. And so David said, don't forget his sons. This is an important opportunity to show kindness and to show mercy to his son. So God's king needs to love mercy, to love kindness. God's king needs to walk humbly with God. He needs to love mercy. And lastly, he needs to act justly. And I believe this is the reasoning behind David's advice about Shimei and Joab. First, let's deal with Shimei in verses 8 to 9. So during that same coup where Barzillai came to David's aid, Shimei opposed David and he supported the coup attempt. You see, Shimei was part of the tribe of Benjamin. David was part of the tribe of Judah. Shimei was part of the tribe that the first king of Israel belonged to, Saul, tribe of Benjamin. That was the person that the people chose, but God rejected him and chose David from the tribe of Judah. Shimei didn't like that. He remained, fa he remained loyal to Saul's throne, even though God had chosen David. And so he didn't like that. He came out when David looked like he was going to lose the kingdom. He cursed him. He flung dust at him. He threw rocks at him. And David could have ordered one of his men to kill him right there and then, but he pardoned him. And when David regained power, he pardoned him again. But now he says to his son Solomon not to think of him as merely innocent. He seems to see him as a threat. Now, it could be that David changed his mind in his old age, and now he wants his son to get revenge. But I just don't think that's the way the chapter wants us to read this. I'll show you a bit more later why I think that, but it's better to see Shimei as a threat to the throne of God's chosen king, Solomon. The other person David tells Solomon to deal with is Joab, and we'll touch on him a bit more in a moment. But the point of these verses, I believe, is that they give us a criteria for godly, effective kingship. And they show us the kind of king or leader Israel needs if the kingdom is going to be made secure, if it is going to be established in righteousness and justice. They tell us that God's king is, in the words of Micah 6 verse 8, to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with his God. This is the criteria for God's king. Next we see... In the rest of the chapter, the actions of God's king. And in this section, we get into what unfolds as Solomon secures the kingdom. And there are four threats he's going to deal with this in this chapter. First, it's the royal threat, Adonijah, his brother, scheming again. A religious threat, Abiathar, the priest. A military threat, Joab, the general. And a tribal threat, Shimei, the Benjamite. First, let's look at Adonijah, the brother. So Adonijah, chapter one, if you hear last week, you heard about how he tried to take the kingship for himself. Again, he comes into our passage and he goes up to Bathsheba, Solomon's mother. He's actually Solomon's half-brother, so he had a different mother. 
and he comes to Bathsheba, and he's kind of cunning, and Bathsheba says, do you come in peace? And he says, yes, and can I talk to you? And gets her permission to say these things he wants to say. And he's kind of bitter he's lost the kingship. He says, you know the kingdom was as good as mine, but God gave it to Solomon, so I just have one request. Just give me one little thing. He's manipulating her. And he says, I just have this one little request that I want you to make of Solomon because he won't refuse you. And she says, okay, well, go ahead. And he says, I just want you to ask him to give me Abishag the Shunammite as my wife. Abishag, I don't know if you remember her from last week. She was the woman who won the beauty pageant in Israel, the most beautiful woman. She was uh, um, given to David, and it seemed like she was, it was more than just platonic. She was given to David as a concubine of sorts. And so when, when Adonijah is asking for this, it's quite troubling, because earlier in the books of Samuel, when Absalom, David's other son, had a coup attempt, he slept with David's concubines in public. And that was like his way of claiming, hey, I'm the king now. And so when Adonijah says, oh, I'd like to marry one of David's, basically a concubine of David's, it's very troubling. It seems like he's still scheming for the throne. Bathsheba doesn't seem to realize this. She goes to David, she makes the request, sorry, to Solomon makes the request, and Solomon, in his wisdom, sees right through it. He realizes Adonijah has put her to it, and he says, to put him to death. Harsh, confronting, but in chapter one, when he had spared Adonijah's life, he told him at that time, he said, if evil is found in you and you are not worthy, you will be put to death. And he acts unworthily and it happens. So that's the first threat that he deals with, the royal threat, Adonijah, his brother. The second threat is the religious threat, Abiathar the priest. So Solomon turns his attention to Abiathar next, and he was, the, he was also part of the, the coup attempt possibly part of this scheme for uh, Abishag as well. And so Solomon turns to him and says, you deserve to die, but because of what you've done for Yahweh, our God, and because of what you've done for David, my father in the past, I'm gonna let you live. Instead, I banish you to your estate in Anathoth, stay out there. And so he loses the priesthood and he gets banished from Jerusalem. That was actually in fulfillment of one of God's judgments against the house of Eli. So God's Judgments and promises seem to be fulfilled in this passage. Thirdly, he then goes to deal with Joab, the general. Joab is this really complex, interesting character. He was really faithful to David in some ways, but he's also very cunning, very ruthless, and he also disobeyed David fragrantly, flagrantly a few times. Not fragrantly, flagrantly. Shouldn't use big words. <laughs> Anyways... Joab, um, he had killed Abner and Amasa. That's what David brings up in the advice. So Abner was one of the generals of Israel. He was helping Saul's line at first, but then eventually he came over to David and said, actually, I'll help you. David spares him. Abner leaves. Joab comes into the room, finds out what's happened, and without David knowing, sends a messenger to tell Abner, oh, wait up, just got to talk to you about something. Finds him, goes into the room, stabs him, kills him. That's Joab, he's ruthless. Same thing with Amasa. He, when he had an opportunity, he finds him, pretends to be friendly. How are you doing, brother? Pulls him in for a hug, slips out a dagger, kills him, leaves him in the spot. So, so Joab is like this cunning, he, he's a pretty bad dude in some ways. So Solomon is told by his father David to deal with him, and he does. He orders his death as well. So that's three threats dealt with. The last threat is Shimei, the one who cursed David, the one from the tribe of Benjamin. Solomon, in his wisdom, calls him in and tells him, you need to build a house in Jerusalem, away from his power base. He lives somewhere else. He said, you need to stay here. You build a house. You can stay here. But if you leave here, you'll die. Shimei knows he's in hot water. He agrees. He says, this is just... But then later on, he breaks his word, he leaves Jerusalem, and Solomon puts him to death. Four threats dealt with, quite confronting, and the chapter ends with verse 46, the kingdom was now established in Solomon's hands. These are the actions of God's king, but what are we to make of this? Maybe you're shocked. Maybe you think David and Solomon are nothing less than political schemers conveniently assassinating their detractors. Now, there's no, no doubt David and Solomon had their flaws. They were capable of evil. But the writer wants us to view David and Solomon in a positive light as God's kings, representing him by carrying out his will. 
Study the passage yourself and see if you come to a different conclusion. But here are a few reasons why I believe Solomon is actually walking humbly before God and, and fulfilling his will. First, I already pointed out the repetition of established in 2 Samuel 7 in our chapter. It seems as if God is, they're, they're doing God's will in this chapter. And in 2 Samuel 7, it was God who said, I will establish, I will establish. And now through Solomon, all these divine well, these actions of justice are being carried out. Secondly, the chapter starts with David telling Solomon to be faithful to God, to obey his law, to keep his commands. It just doesn't make sense that he's saying this and emphasizing this, and he says, and do all these things to break God's law. It just doesn't make sense, as good a sense. Thirdly, the men Solomon banished and executed weren't simply critics. David had a critic. His name was Nathan the prophet. When he committed adultery with Bathsheba, he was severely criticized by Nathan. He never put him to death. There was no problem with him. These guys weren't critics. They were schemers. They had participated in a coup. They were enemies of God's king. And they deserved justice. The writer wants us to see that Solomon was doing justice by judging these men, even if that's hard to stomach with our modern sensibilities. How can judgment and punishment be good things? Well, in this case, we can say it has secured the kingdom. There's just been a, a coup, it was unstable, and now he's secured and established the kingdom in justice. And if Solomon keeps on walking with God, more blessing will come. But secondly, King Solomon actually foreshadows King Jesus in this chapter. He's not any old Israelite issuing the death penalty here. It's not like Ben Fien issuing the death penalty for someone who's wronged him. He's not any old Israelite. He's the king of God's people. He's a forerunner to Jesus. And because of the positive hints we see in the chapter, I believe it's right for us to see him as, a fore, as foreshadowing Jesus in his ministry. Jesus fulfills the same criteria for a king that we see in David's instructions. He walked humbly with God. He never broke his law. He loved mercy. He loved kindness. He, he forgave a woman who was dragged before him when she was caught in adultery. He forgave her. He touched a leper who had never hadn't been touched for years, who was excommunicated from the city. He touched a leper and cleansed them. And he even asked his father to forgive those who were in the very act of crucifying him. He loved mercy. But let's not forget that Jesus also acted justly. He did justice. He said to one of the towns, Woe to you, Capernaum. If the works that had been done in you had been done in cities like Sodom and Gomorrah in the past, they would have repented long ago. So it would be worse for you on the day of judgment. Jesus said, Woe to you, to Pharisees. You were like whitewashed tombs, a brood of vipers. Jesus even pronounced the siege and destruction of Jerusalem. So yes, Jesus walked humbly with God and loved mercy, but he also did everything justice requires. And when he returns, justice will be done finally and decisively. Paul said in 2 Thessalonians, this will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel announcement of our Lord Jesus. Terrifying words. How can Jesus do this? How can he be a good and loving king if he does this? Well, let me read to you what one theologian, his name is Miroslav Volf, what he said. He said, I used to think that wrath or anger was unworthy of God. Isn't God love? Shouldn't divine love be beyond wrath? God is love and God loves every person and every creature. That's exactly why God is wrathful against some of them. My last resistance to the idea of God's wrath was a casualty of the war in the former Yugoslavia, the region from which I come. According to some estimates, 200,000 people were killed and over 3 million people were displaced. My villages and cities were destroyed. My people shelled day in and day out, some of them brutalized beyond imagination. And I could not imagine God not being angry. Or think of Rwanda in the last decade of the past century, where 800,000 people were hacked to death in 100 days. How did God react to the carnage? By doting on the perpetrators in a grandparently fashion? 
by refusing to condemn the bloodbath, but instead affirming the perpetrator's basic goodness? Wasn't God fiercely angry with them? Though I used to complain about the indecency of the idea of God's wrath, I came to think that I would have to rebel against a God who wasn't wrathful at the sight of the world's evil. God isn't wrathful in spite of being love. God is wrathful because he is love. So although the fullness of justice can be terrifying, it is necessary and good and loving. So back to our initial question, what kind of government could bring peace and security to our world? More specifically, what kind of leader would such a government need? Well, the answer is the the government of heaven, the kingdom of heaven. The answer is a king who can act justly and love mercy and walk humbly with his God. And our chapter has focused in on the justice side of things. It shows us a king has the strength to do the really difficult actions that justice requires. Ultimately, it points forward to King Jesus. Yes, Jesus is humble and he loves mercy, but if we don't don't repent, he will give us justice. When he returns, he will come as a judge and as a warrior to rid our world of evil and injustice. And first, first and foremost, praise God, that means he will destroy our ultimate enemies, Satan, sin, and death. He's going to remove every corruption from creation. He will end slavery. He will end cancer. He will end abuse. He will end terrorism. He will end tyranny. Jesus is the leader that our world desperately needs. There is no other way. If we don't repent, justice has to be done and we need someone who is good enough and trustworthy enough and strong enough to carry that out. And the justice of Jesus cuts both ways. It's good news for the oppressed, for the abused, for the victims of this world. It's good news for those who support the reign of Jesus. We need to know about God's justice. But it's terrifying news for the oppressors and for those who oppose the reign of King Jesus. When Jesus returns, their judgment will be decisive and final and full. God's king will secure his kingdom through the humility of obedience, the kindness of mercy, and the severity of judgment. Jesus is not too weak to judge. He doesn't take pleasure in judgment. He doesn't enjoy the death of the wicked. He'd much prefer we repent and receive his forgiveness. This is why 2 Peter says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise to return, that is, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Jesus doesn't want his creatures to perish, but one day his offer of pardon will end. That's scary. But the good news is that when our king will return, he will right every wrong, he will end every evil, he will remove every corruption in this world, and we will rejoice in him. Let's pray. Jesus, we just come before you and we repent if we've ever emptied you of your authority, treated you like you're just another creature like us. You are God in the flesh and you have all authority and dominion and power. Even though you could do whatever you want, we thank you that you do only what is just. And we thank you that you love mercy. You humbled yourself. You suffered in our place. You died on the cross. Jesus, help us to receive that offer of pardon while it is available. To come to you, to find mercy in you, to find healing in you. And we thank you, Lord, that as we find comfort in you, that we know that you are strong and that you will rectify wrongs. 
We thank you that you're a king we can trust in who will establish our world once again in peace when you return. Jesus, we look to you today. Help us as your people to imitate you in acting justly and loving mercy and walking humbly with you. Lord, help us to be yours and to find our peace in you. We love you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Church, would you stand with us? We're going to sing and respond, but I just want to bless you with these words from 1 Thessalonians. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Amen.
praise be to the Lord, to God our Saviour, who daily bears our burdens. Our God is a God who saves. Amen. If you'd like to pray with somebody this morning, you can head to the prayer corner. And if you've joined us online, we would love to connect with you in person soon. God bless you all.